Hey everyone, my name is Bryn Lopez. I am the manager of Children's Book World in Los Angeles, and we are so excited to be here with one of our very favorite creative human beings, groundbreaking pioneer children's book author, Lisa Yee, to talk with her about her multi-award winning middle grade novel, Maisie Chen's Last Chance. Look at all of this metal bling on the cover of your book. I think yeah. there's even gonna be more bling coming onto that, onto that book cover. Uh, this is, event is sponsored by our friends at Teach API, who help kids and communities navigate and celebrate their Asian American Pacific Islander heritage in schools and beyond. Um, there's a particular focus this month because it is a API uh, Heritage and History Month. Um, and But this is something that we want to celebrate all year round. So we're excited to be able to have this talk and share it with librarians and schools and all sorts of communities. Um, who have fallen in love with this particular book. How are you today, Lisa? I'm good, how are you? Great, I can see all of your Maisie uh, uh, inspirations behind you. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. terrific. You were born and raised here near Los, An in, near Los Angeles or in the LA area. You attended Brightwood Elementary School in Monterey Park, Alhambra High School, and the University of Southern California. So do you consider yourself at heart a California girl? Oh, I am I'm definitely <laughs> a California girl. And uh yeah, I mean, when I think of home, it's it's back in the LA area. Yeah. And so you you take that sort of California feel wherever you go, uh <laughs> any environment you're in probably as well, well, right? Well, if I can if I can give you a, a confession. Um, I spend winters in LA because right now I'm on the East Coast and I'm a wimp and I can't <laughs> be cold weather. I, I need my sunshine. So I go yeah. back every winter. Yeah, and you're in a place where it really snows, like it gets really, really cold <laughs> too. Yeah. Which is interesting. Well, I will talk about it, but but Maisie is set in though she lives in with her mom in California, it's set in Minnesota, which also gets some incredible uh s snowstorms though this takes place during the summertime so we don't experience that but that's a whole interesting side i never thought about that with her grandparents mm -hmm. what snows would be like uh in in last chance um i want to just talk about your other books your first books the first trilogy millicent man girl genius stanford wong flunks big time and so totally emily evers um three books that summarized three preteens experiences in Rancho Rosetta during the summer. Um, real briefly about those books. The first book, Millicent Min is uh, 20 years old. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel, what, do people, do, do different generations of kids come, still write you or talk to you about those books and the impact that they have on them? They do. And, and and what's interesting is now I'm getting all these letters and meeting people who read the books when they were younger and now they're adults. I'm like, oh, my gosh, how old am I now? But I mean, um, they they tell me um, that for many of them, it was the first time that they saw a contemporary Asian protagonist in a book or certainly on a book cover and how much it meant to them. And it, it's funny because at the time when I was writing it, I was just writing a book. I wasn't thinking about mm -hmm. the impact it would have later. No, I mean, that, but, but you really were, I, I feel like you were, the, the, you know, that, that idea of being a pioneer about breaking ground, though I think, you know, there were probably characters that existed and there were writers who were writing, but so much of it was historical fiction or, you know, that type of story. And just to have a story about kids being kids, going to school and having all sorts of failures and uh you know fantastic things as well a lot of failure a lot of failure yeah. because you know that's what middle school's about um it's incredible that you you now have all these people who who you write you you brought that to them um i'm so excited i know we share a friend gene yang who's american born chinese is about to hit the airwaves this weekend i know i know i'm so excited about that Right. And he I bet that's going to be another thing for people where they're seeing because that's such a book about identity as well. Um, and for uh, people to be able to see that story, hear that story, uh, connect with that story. Um, it's going to be an incredible thing. Oh, yeah, I can't wait. 
But your newest book is Maisie Chen's Last Chance. It won the Asian American Pacific Literature Award for Best Book, the Newbery Honor, and was a National Book Award finalist. What did it feel like when those awards began? What did, by the time you were through with that, I mean, how were you feeling about all that? I I didn't know what was happening. I still don't know what is happening because it's the weirdest thing. Because when you're writing a book, you're you're by yourself. You're mm -hmm. just sitting in your office with your toys and you're writing and you have no idea if anyone will like it, much less even read it. So when the accolades started coming in, I was stunned. I I remember I remember when I got the um you know, when I found out like about National Book Awards, it's like, is maybe it's a prank. Maybe somebody <laughs> is pranking me and this isn't really happening. I mean, I, I, it was so hard to, to wrap my head around all of that. Yeah. And these are very, for those of you who don't know, all of these organizations are completely separate from each other. They are different groups of people, different groups of committees who are looking at the books. And there are so many books that you look at. So for Maisie to be chosen from all of these places, it means that just that her story that you wrote, the character that you created, had such an impact on people as they were um, reading it. I know for me personally, I by the time I was done with it, I was like, oh, this is the book. This is my book of the year because I, I, I really, and I read a lot, you know, but I just felt like I was, I, I got Maisie completely. And I loved it. Can you tell us a little bit about the story of Maisie Chen's Last Chance? For the few, most people have read this, but for the people who haven't read it yet. Yeah, Maisie Chen's Last Chance is about a girl who was born and raised in Los Angeles, like I was, um, who goes to Last Chance, Minnesota, a place she's never been to before, to visit her grandparents, who she's only seen once and very briefly. And they own the only Chinese restaurant in town, the only Chinese restaurant around. And while she's there, she helps take care of her ailing grandfather, whom she calls Opa. And he starts teaching her poker and how to read a room and how to play poker. And the book is full of mystery and suspense and humor. It's about family and fun and, and quibbles and racism and relationships. I mean, there's a, it's kind of like, like a, you know, like, Chinese uh, chow fun. There's a lot of ingredients in there and they all get tangled up together, but it's like a really good meal. Um, so all of all of that happens to Maisie while she's in Last Chance, Minnesota, and she realizes that this place that she thought was so foreign to her is really just like home. That's such a great analogy about the food and what that what the book is and like so many special books. I mean, that's really what it's about. So many different lines of thought and ideas. You have historical aspects with the with Chinese history um, and immigration that are there. There's other parts of it which I thought we haven't touched on, but um, I loved that Maisie uh, is her 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 family is a single mom. Um, and it's, and there's so many kids who have that kind of family with a single, single parent, it could be a mother or it could be a father and themselves. And that is their family unit. Uh, and it could just be that that is their family unit. It doesn't mean that they were married in the, you know, that none of that. And I really love that representation. Was that something that you thought about when you, you know, um, put that in there? What? Actually, in the first draft of the novel, um, Macy had a mom and dad. And then as I as the story started evolving, I really wanted to shore up the relationship with Maisie and her mom and then Maisie's mom and her grandmother. And so I decided that Maisie's mom was going to be a single mom. And, and really, the book is about family, but it's not necessarily blood relations either, because to me, family is is what you make of it. Family could be your neighbors. It could be your friends. It could be a it could be a stranger that you don't know yet. That's going to be part of your orbit and part of your world. So by putting, making the book about Maisie and her mom, I think it strengthened the story. Um, in, you talked about it because when she moves to this community, Opa has a very good friend 
uh, Werner, who is part of the Minnesota community, and they're on the outs. They're like brothers or siblings that don't want to talk to each other. Can you talk about that? And also where the names Oma and Opa come from? Okay, so um, Oma and Opa are German for grandmother and grandfather. And and Maisie is a Chinese American, as am I. And so because we're in my office, I get to, I'm going to like mm -hmm. reach over and take a picture off my wall. Um, so this is my mom's family. What a great picture. And that's my mom. And this is in the back of the book, too. But when my grandparents came over, um, it was uh, they came over from China in the 1920s. It was so important for them to be American. And what happened was they had a German midwife delivering their babies and she was blonde and to them she looked white. So the, to them it was like, she's American. So they had the German midwife name all their children, which is why I have an Uncle Otto and Uncle Alfred, Auntie Harriet, Auntie Verna, <laughs> Auntie Leona. They all had German names. And, you know, I kind of use that in the book as to why uh, Maisie calls her grandparents Oma and Opa because that has been in their family with the German um, name for grandmother and grandfather for generations because mm -hmm. it was the same kind of thing wanting to be what they perceived was American. That's such a part of of uh, with, particularly in the United States in the 20th century uh, immigrant communities that were coming into the United States when they came in they did want to try to adapt as quickly as they possibly could. Um, and they would take on names that they saw on movies or in television or books or whatever it may be. And um, that's so interesting. But there's also a tradition of having an American name, but also still having a name that would be a Chinese name or a Korean name. Is that is that correct too within communities? Yes, yeah. Yeah. So um, now Maisie has never seen. Did you get to did you get to know your grandparents when you were young? Did, were you close to them? I, I did, actually. Um, so on my mother's side, my my grandmother and grandfather, um, they when my both my parents are public school teachers or were retired public school teachers. And so when they were at work, my grandmother and grandmother, Papa and, and Gung Gung, they took care of me. So I got to know them very well. And it was interesting because they spoke Chinese and I spoke English and yet we totally understood each other. And I mean, they spoke broken, they spoke broken English, they spoke English also, mm -hmm. but sometimes they would speak to me in Chinese and I could understand them. And then sadly, as I got older, I couldn't understand them as well as when I was little. So that- Isn't that know, interesting? Yeah. You know, maybe part of that was, I find like when you're little too, you um, connect with body language and yeah. you know that sort of thing that you can feel a sense of something in a way that you don't, you sort of lose that when you get older. Yeah. Um, but it's probably something we should all have still is <laughs> being able yeah. to observe people's body language. Um, so I wanna talk about, um, first off the, the history that you, in, could you talk about the history that's inside the book. You talk about the past of um, uh, Opa's family and how they actually came to the United States and tell the history of many um, Chinese people during the 19th century who built America. They built the ability for things that we take for granted now, the ability to get from one part of the country to another part of the country. Um, they built it and are responsible for that. And I would love for you to talk about um, that history that you've included in the book. Yeah, so the book is actually, it's a contemporary story, but then there's a historical aspect to it. And when Maisie is there, her grandfather starts telling her about her great-great-grandfather, Lucky Chen, who came over from China in the 1850s and his job on the railroads and uh, in San Francisco. And so we follow kind of two stories at the same time. And Maisie is learning all this stuff that she had no idea about. It was kind of like she's watching a movie, only it's of her whole family, about her great-great-grandfather working on the railroads. There were more than 20,000 Chinese who worked on the railroads who, who helped create the, you know, the Western part of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, she learns about 
a thing called paper sun, something she didn't know about. And so she goes in the back of her grandparents' Chinese restaurant, the Golden Palace, and there's this wall that's very mysterious to her because it's black and white photos of young men. And she doesn't know who they are. And she later learns that they are young men that came over from China and they had papers that said that they were the sons of residents of the United States. And because of those papers, it allowed them to come to the US. So she's learning about all this kind of stuff that she had she had no idea about and she didn't even she didn't even think to ask because she didn't know these stories were even there. Mm -hmm. It's and I what I love about it is and I've talked to kids about it who have real questions about um, this where they were inspired by that history um, and your telling of it because um, that's not something that you find in being taught in classrooms um, about the immigrant experience, particularly. You learn a lot about the history of a particular kind of American history where we talk about presidents or we talk about the senators or we talk about, you know, particular business people and such uh, and achievements. But we don't talk about the history of so many other people who um, came to the to this country. Um, I wanted to continue on with the Paper Sons, the story of San Francisco and the earthquake and how they were able to, because there were attempts to, you could talk about the Exclusion Act and the attempts to get rid of Chinese Americans in the United States. Yeah, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which, which came about, you know, um, in, in like around 18, I think it was 1864, around there, um, they limited the number of Chinese people that could come to America to less than 200. And so that's why the Paper Sons came about where they would they would get these documents and they would forge these documents and say that they had, because you could come over if you had a relative. And with the earthquake in San Francisco, which destroyed most of San Francisco, the silver lining was the thing that was also destroyed were all the records of all the immigrants, not just Chinese, but all the immigrants mm -hmm. who had entered the US through San Francisco. So that opened the door for people to say, well, I was here and you had my records, but they got destroyed in the earthquake. And so that's how so many Chinese, be, you know, got to come to America and became uh, Chinese Americans. It's so interesting to me, you know, think about um, this, uh, this experience that we're talking about with Chinese Americans, certainly with Japanese Americans during World War II, who were, um, you know, put into encampments and imprisoned um and all of their things taken away from them and their their citizenship basically every aspect of that and also in the latino communities in california where they had come as workers and were working and were had had lives and then in the 1920s and 30s were told to remove themselves from the country and go back to mexico though they'd never had an existence uh, <laughs> there and you see it over and over and over again this idea of being able and we still have it going on today a, a lot of the things that we have with book banning is about ex taking away people's identity um so why is it important now as an author do you for, do you feel to like people like yourself or gene yang or um uh jackie woodson or margarita angle writing books about identity um why is that important oh i i think it's everything and um you know so many times we think that we're alone or that the questions we have about who we are or where we've been or who we're going to become that nobody else has these thoughts and when i was growing up i'm growing up in los angeles chinese american i I wasn't really thinking about that a lot until I moved to a part of the country where I was the only Asian person around and people were asking me, where are you from? And I'd say, well, I'm from Los Angeles. And they're like, no, where are you from? I'm like, well, I'm LA. And they're like, where are you really from? I'm like, oh, you, where are my people from? You know, and I would say that I, I was Chinese, but I started getting the feeling that um, people were looking at me as, as, not an American, not, a, you know, I was born and raised in Los Angeles and my parents were born and raised in America. And so it started me questioning for the first time about my lineage and 
did I belong here? Should I belong here? And the answer is yes, a resounding mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> but it got me thinking and asking questions. And I wish I, had, I hadn't waited so long. And that like when my grandparents were around, I wish I had asked them more. But as a little kid, I was more concerned with, you know, are we going to get ice cream today or what's going to happen? You know, so I started talking to my parents and I would encourage anyone, whether you've read Maisie or not, if you want to hear a great story, talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents or talk to your neighbors and mm -hmm. ask them, what was it like when you were a kid? Because you're going to hear the most amazing things you've ever heard in your life. Do you think, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, um, are there special things, ways of, to go about that? For instance, there are some parents or grandparents who might not want to talk. Grandpas in particular, maybe they went through a particular hard time um, and they may not be, is there a way of being able to ask these questions or bring it up to have this type of conversation? Yes, I mean that that's a that's a great point. And you're right. A lot of the um, a lot of the elderly um, in America, they don't want to talk about it. It wasn't necessarily a great time for them or the the way people came to the United States, they 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 just, you know, they want to kind of set that aside. But instead of asking the big questions like, how did you get here and and what were your struggles? You might ask something like, what did you like to eat when you were a kid? <laughs> you know, what did you like to do? What was your favorite thing to do on a Saturday? And that opens up a world of things. It's like Maisie and Opa, her grandfather, you know, when they started talking and then he starts teaching her how to play poker. So they started bonding over a, a gambling game, actually, you know, <laughs> that forged their relationship. Oh yeah. I have that when I had that with my own grandfather who was so much older than I was. I mean, he was born in 1900. He was 70 when I was born, you know, and or 67. And, um, but Dominoes was the Dominoes, which is a very old school grandpa sort of game, right? Not, not the pizza, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, not the pizza, not the pizza Dominoes, yeah. an actual, you know, uh, an actual game um, with tiles. Like, there's so many traditional things that are part of that. Food is very important. Food is an important part of your book and your books that you have done. Why is food such a, a special thing to write about? I love food. I mean, <laughs> so um, I have a picture here. So like when, like I've had many different careers mm -hmm. and one of my careers was writing menus for Red Lobster. That's, that's me in the back. And I love so, it. Um, so when, when I would write commercials, I would write TV commercials and I would write, um, you know, um, things about food. There was always a, a food stylist on board. And that's the person who makes the food look great. And so that worked its way into Maisie's story. But I feel that that food, it, it really it bridges the generations. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, a, a great meal is just something that everyone can share and whether or not they they know each other. And I found this photo. This is this is of my mom and my grandpa and my dad and my great uncle Robert. Look at all that food. i love it i love it <laughs> so every every sunday um when i was young all the relatives would meet at my grandparents house and everybody would bring food and there was always a feast on the table and and so i remember that you know j not not just the food but i remember as a little kid i would sit under the table because you could listen to every, you could listen to the grown-ups talk, and you could poke their feet and do all that kind of stuff. But but food is another bond that I think that everybody has, no matter where you come from. It's something that you can put on the table and share. Yeah, and that's a that's something that you those memories will stay with you forever. Um, and food with Maisie and her uh, grandparents is a, a a part of the rituals of the things that they that bond them together. I wanted to talk, I know you love nature, like I do. You love to go on walks and you love to be surrounded by nature. Right. Yeah. And your father raised beautiful bonsai trees. And I wanted to share some of the images of them for you to talk about because 
and talk about bonsais in particular. I'm going to bring them onto the stage for us, and then they're going to come on right now, and I'm going to make them the focus. Here we go. Can you see all now? Talk to us about these beautiful, beautiful trees. So my dad is a bonsai master, and he um, was one of the creators of a species of cork jade plants, of cork jade um, bonsai plants. Because what he was doing one day was he was in his garden, this this huge garden with all his bonsais, and um, there were bugs everywhere. So he sprayed them with DDT, which is a as a chemical that's been outlawed and it killed so many things but what happened is the jade plant the the, the base of it um started corking and had this texture and so he became known as the father of the cork jade plant and i love the the fact that like one time he said that he could look at a young plant and he could know what it was going to be like in 50 wow. years and, and so that that is a way of storytelling mm -hmm. plant Plants will outlive us. They will. They have their own stories to tell. And to me, it was. It's kind of like generational. It's kind of how Opa tells Maisie the story of her great great grandfather because it's passed along. But this is something live that is passed along through generations. And how old are some of these uh, trees that we see here? Really old. <laughs> <laughs> older than me so it's really really old. I mean, wow yeah yeah i mean probably you know 60 70 uh maybe even older older than that and i see a character from Maisie, uh Maisie, uh the book uh peeking out of this bonsai tree who is that okay. <laughs> here he is Bye. this is this is Bud the Bear, and he features prominently in the story. He goes missing at one point. <laughs> and so I post these things on social media and on my website, lisayee.com, where, where Bud is hiding in pictures. And I challenge the readers to find Bud. So yeah. he's sitting here at another one, right? He's right at the front of there. <laughs> That's Bud the Bear. Yep. Now, this looks, from the perspective, it looks gigantic, but it's not that big. Yeah, if you can see how big Bud really is, mm -hmm. you can see um, how big that bonsai tree is. It's actually it's actually quite small. And if you look at the bonsais, they're 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 all they're miniature. They're small, mm -hmm. but the bigger the base, the bigger the roots are, the older they are. Ah, it is just such a magnificent. How many do you think he he has? Uh, in this is his like a backyard. Uh, yeah, and you're yeah. and, the, and this is the home you grew up in, right? Yes, in Monterey Park. Yes, um, hundreds and hundreds. Wow! I so never, beautiful. I remember once trying to count as a kid, but I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna go through. There's each one is so unique. It is like a snowflake. Yes. Yeah, and there. These, are, yeah, there are no two that are alike. And the sculptures that are in them are so interesting as well. Um, I'm going to go through because I also had a picture of um, his rock sculptures. Yeah, he also did these rock sculptures um, where he would get these rocks and, and he would place them and he would, you know, he had this eye where he could look at things and he could determine what, what the, you know, the what the front of something was and things like that. And, you know, it's the same thing like um, at the Golden Palace, the, the restaurant that's been in Maisie's family forever. Mm -hmm. um, her grandparents and, and great grandparents and, and before that, it's the kind of the same thing when you're creating a dish or you're creating a food, you know how it's going to look. And then her mother, who's the food stylist, brings another level to it by adding little small little touches to the dish that you already thought was perfect. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like, I think what my dad did with the bonsais. The bonsais, the, the plants come from nature. The plants are mother's nature, mother nature's gifts. But then he would just trim them away and make them look the best they could be. Did he have other friends that he shared this passion with of creating the, the bonsai trees? Yes, he, he often spoke at, um, 
at the Arboretum or Huntington Gardens or places like that. Um, if you're interested in bonsai, you just Google his name, Frank Yi, and um, he's he's got this one YouTube video that has over a hundred thousand views. Wow! It's, I don't know how to get those numbers. You know, <laughs> he's an influencer. Yes. So <laughs> that is wonderful. I want. I can't wait to be able to look at that. It's just so magical, and that's part of. And also, the bonsai trees and the rock sculptures are such an uh, important part of AAPI culture as well. Within many different cultures within the AAPI um, um, stories, um, and that was a oh also a way I think for immigrants to be able to continue to have a part of their culture when they came to a new place, right? Exactly. You you bring it over. It's a part of you. It's in your blood. It never really leaves you. Yeah. So I would just like to know as we as we um, um, wrap up, I just wanted to know about what it has been like in this experience of from the beginning of writing this book now to it's in paperback. The only other thing we need, maybe a movie, we made a movie or a miniseries, right? Um, but what what has this experience been like for you? It has been. I'm going to take this back off. Let me. I'm going to just unfocus this real quick, and so we can see you. Okay. Um, <laughs> there we go. It, it, it writing the writing this book was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, you know, because I went, I dug so deep into not just my past, but the past of of Chinese immigrants in America and setting the book starting in China. It was so difficult because I was also writing during the middle of COVID. And so there was a lot of um, a hate against Asians happening. And uh, it, it, it made it even harder for me to write. At one point, I, I just couldn't even write. I was just too busy crying. And I wanted to think of like, how can I help my community? What can I do? And I realized, well, I can keep writing. And so um, getting to the finish line on the book. And it was also, you know, people think of, of you know, it's, it's only the author, but I had a lot of people behind me. I had an expert on Chinese food and Chinese customs and the railroads and everything. I wanted to get everything right. So we had all this team of people working on the book. And, and uh, by the time it came out, I was just exhausted. <laughs> and then um, to... To have this out now, it's been like a little over a year. Um, I I I can't I can't believe I I did it. I can't. It's like, wow! I I wrote that book. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like it's one now. It's one of your kids. Do you consider these books to be like your? You know? <laughs> I do. My daughter once pointed out. I think she wrote an essay about it for school because you had to write about your family or something, and she said. My mother sits around the dinner table and talks about characters in her books like they're real people. Because I remember, <laughs> like, I was writing Stanford, Wong Flunk's Big Chung, with the sun, and, you know, at the time, I'm like, you won't believe what Stanford did today. And I, I truly, I, I think of all of them as my babies. I love that. That's a great author story. And um, uh, that's just so wonderful. I really appreciate uh, your sharing all of this thoughtfulness and, and inspiration with us, Lisa. Now, I'm going to leave it with knowing that there's another new series on the horizon with our good friend, Dan Santat. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So, um, Garrett, Dan and I are actually really good friends. <laughs> um, oh, wait, wrong picture. Here we are. We're actually <laughs> very good friends. We met each other well, over 20 years ago before either one of us is published. So um, the series is called The Misfits. The first book out is uh, The Misfits, A Royal Conundrum. And it's a mystery. Um, it's set at, on a in an island in San Francisco. It's kind of like Alcatraz. And there's this old castle turned uh, high security prison, which is now a reforming art school. It's five misfits who get thrown together. And they find out that... Uh, Things aren't as they seem to be, and they aren't as they thought they were, and they try to solve the biggest heist of the century. And uh, Dan is the illustrator on that book. It's a it's a middle grade series, and I'm so excited about it. And it's so different from Maisie. That is so exciting. I can't wait for that. I love both of you, and having you together 
uh, is an incredible thing. It is so wonderful to be your friend and to have you be part of our uh, children's book world community, but also the community of authors and children's book writers. Your impact is endless. It's just, I know so many people who love your work and I'm sure you hear about it all the time, but thank you so much for being you, Lisa Yee. <laughs> thank you invi for inviting me. Absolutely. So we'll see you all again. Um, we will be doing this again next fall. We'll have so many more authors to bring to you um, uh, with their important stories. But thank you for uh, this last school year. Um, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you all. Bye bye.